pressure reveals what's inside us, but it's useful information to help us grow. The Pharisees come and make another attack at Jesus, and they would soon regret it. We're halfway through the book of Matthew and uh, that we completed last week. We're now into chapter 15, and this is a book on discipleship that Matthew is letting us know how to understand Jesus' words, how to we understand the narrative of his life, his mission, his purpose, and uh, also for us to be able to be good disciples ourselves. So there's a lot that we can learn uh, from these examples. And you know what? There might even be just a little bit of Pharisee in each and every one of us. Well, first of all, before I jump into these first 20 verses, I want to kind of give some descriptions of who some of the players were at this time. The Pharisees were a, the most popular and authoritative sect of Judaism in Israel at the time. They had their own oral traditions that dated all the way back to the exile and before. They would claim that the way that they have had the law brought to them wasn't just their law that they invented, you know, in the first century BC, uh, but just simply put that they would take it that their traditions, their interpretations of the Bible go all the way back to Moses, who got it from God on Sinai who then gave it to Joshua, and then Joshua gave it to the elders, and the elders gave it down through uh, the centuries. And in particular, a group of rabbis and teachers that came out of the exile hundreds of years earlier. So they would consider their interpretation of the law to be ironclad. They would consider it to be authoritative and even equal to the written word of God itself. So whenever Jesus breaks one of their traditions, they see it as he's the same thing as breaking one of God's laws. So they see it as a really, really big deal. And uh, they held to a more literal understanding of, um, of Scripture, and they did believe in the afterlife, and they did believe in taking God seriously. And uh, whereas on the other side, you have teachers of the law that could be just people who were experienced in the written law of knowing what it meant and what it said. And then further than that, you would have uh, the Sadducees. They were more an elite, more an aristocratic a uh, group of, of Jews who didn't believe in the afterlife, who thought all the blessings that God talked about in the Bible only were to happen in this life, and that way they were able to actually not take things as specific in the Old Testament that the, the Pharisees did. So the Pharisees were more fundamentalists, and the uh, Sadducees were more of the elitists, willing to even compromise for the sake of their own um, values. So they wouldn't mind Roman influence coming into uh, Judaism at all, but the Pharisees did mind that. The Pharisees on top of that also were really rigorous in their day-to-day -day life when it came to purity rites. Anything that they could see out of the book of Moses had to be imposed very legalistically and very tough. Never really understanding why it was written in the first place. Uh, you know, for example, one of them is don't cut the sides of your hair. And you'll notice today there are Jews that don't still cut the sides of their hair. And it is not because God does not like uh, short buzz cuts on the side of your head. It's because neighboring nations used to shave the sides of their heads as a form of worship of one of their gods. And so God is saying, I don't want you to act like the other people. I don't want you to worship me the way that these people worship their gods. I want you to be unique. And again, so that's the reason why he said, don't put two different kinds of seeds in the same field was because I don't want you mixing with the people around you. And that was for the covenant of Israel, not for Christians for today. So Jesus is saying these things had a purpose. There's a spiritual purpose to help us to be dedicated to God and for us to not to fall into idolatry to other religions. But these guys by this point had turned it into this is how you worship God and uh, had no context to it other than just strict obedience. And it had lost basically all its meaning is what Jesus says. And so these are the players at hand. It's usually the Pharisees and the teachers of the law that are the more plentiful and they are the most popular. Uh, and so they were seen as the ones, the really the authoritative ones. The Sadducees were just kind of put up with because they held high positions, and they were the vast minority of uh, the Jewish ruling council. And so with that, why don't we just jump into the scriptures here to see what Jesus is talking about here, and how we can make sure that we don't have a tradition or our own understanding that nullifies the word of God. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem, and they asked, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Jesus replied, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father and mother is devoted to God, they are not to honor their fa father or mother with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human 
rules. Jesus called the crowd to him and he said, listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that's what defiles them. Then the disciples came to him and asked, do you know what the, that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? He replied, every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them. They are blind guides. If the blind leads the blind, then both will fall into a pit. Peter said, explain the parable to us. Are you still so dull? Jesus asked them. Don't you see that whatever enters the, um, the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person, but eating with one unwashed hands does not defile them. So as always, I just want to start with the text to kind of go uh, all the observations that we can find out of here to learn what happened in context in Jesus' time, and then how can we can apply this to our lives and how we can be aware that out of the overflow of our hearts, our mouth speaks, and what can we do to make sure that our hearts are, are moldable by God and that we don't become rigid. Well, first we see that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law came from Jerusalem, and so Jesus is still doing his ministry in the north. There was lots of Pharisees in the north all through that time period, but this is uh, clearly some grander delegation. Jesus has become very famous by this point, and uh, so they're coming to check him out, and they see that his disciples are not washing their hands before they eat. It was a common tradition to uh, at the time to wash one's hands and feet. It was kind of seen as customary in a hot and dusty world, that especially if you had sandals, to if you had a guest come to your home to provide water to wash their hands and feet just to keep cleanliness and refreshment. And uh, But when before eating, this was done a step further, where basically kind of like a gravy scoop full of water was poured onto each person's hands up to their wrists, and uh, the, his disciples were not doing so. It is noted that in Exodus 30 verse 18 is where the priests are told to wash their hands and feet before they touch the consecrated things in the temple. But it is not in the written law that you have to do so before eating in one's own home. And so again, the Pharisees had made a tradition, had made a law. They said, hey, if that's good for the priests, that's good for everybody for every circumstance. And the thought behind it was, what if I touch something unclean? Now I'm going to put it in my mouth and then I'll have uncleanliness through my whole body. And it was just this kind of legalistic paranoia is probably the best way to, to explain that. So Jesus is telling them that their oral law, they, that by the way, the, the disciples did not break a written law. Their oral law doesn't count. And that would have been deeply offensive to them because they viewed it one and the same, and Jesus did not. He's telling them, Jesus is now giving the oral word to which Matthew puts down as saying, this is how you're supposed to understand the written law. So this is mostly what Jesus is doing in his teaching ministry, is he's correcting the oral tradition law that had been ingrained in the people for quite some time. And he's telling them that they've got it wrong, that it isn't authoritative. In fact, it's the opposite. It's useless. And, uh, and it hurts people. And Jesus is giving out uh, on basically a new oral tradition, as it were, which is now the word of God. We, we take the words of Christ that he explains what those old covenant, strange, ancient commands mean for us today. And uh, so he told them, look, you guys, uh, you guys uh, do all this um, extra stuff that you don't need to. And then you nullify the actual word of God to get what you want. Now, the next example is Jesus goes on to correct them, and he goes on to show them their hypocrisy when he says that if you can make a vow to God that you're going to give, say, a certain amount of funds to the temple, which was a noble thing to do. But then, then after you give that vow, say your parents fall on very hard times, and then you tell people, I can't look after my mom and dad because I don't have any money left because I promised that I would sell that land and give it to the temple. So that was the, the exception they were to give because they viewed vows very highly. And for someone to break their vow, even to look after a parent, would have been considered uh, worse than looking after their parents. And he, so he goes on to say, you know, that they're, um, they can not look after their mom and dad to keep from breaking that vow because breaking vows were very serious, serious sins. They would have been impressed with Jesus' high elevation of mom and dad, but they still would have been uh, pretty upset with them by uh, telling them this. And now, by the way, you know, keeping your vows is an important thing, but Jesus here is highlighting and really elevating, no, look after your mom and dad. You know, God will understand in those circumstances that you didn't know any better. And Jesus teaches in numerous places, and we'll get there soon, on when giving vows. And he's really saying, don't do vows, because you end up entrapping yourself. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything else comes from the evil one, is what Jesus teaches a little bit later on. So Jesus has been teaching 
Don't get into these kind of vows in the first place. Look after mom and dad. Don't worry about someone not washing their hands before they eat. All the stuff that they were just, had all the outward trappings of religion, but was dead inside. And he quotes Isaiah the prophet to say, they honor me with their lips, but they deny me with their hearts. Well, that's uh, a really damning uh, thing to say to them. He's saying that you're dead on the inside. And so Jesus addresses the way that they do things. And he goes, like, look, guys, the stuff on the outside that does not defile you. It might make you ceremonial and clean, but it doesn't defile you. In fact, what defiles is what comes out of you, because that tells you what's really what's going on inside. His disciples had a hard time understanding that, and they had asked for some clarification. And he's saying, no food here uh, is, is going to defile you. you know, whatever you eat it, it just gets destroyed and eliminated <laughs> and uh, out of the body, as, as it were. And whereas what comes out of the heart is our evil thoughts, our evil desires, and we try to justify them, to make them seem right when we know that they're wrong. We're warned all throughout the Bible that our heart can be very deceitful to ourselves, because when we want what we want, we will come up with just as many convoluted um, stories or laws or traditions that justify it the same way the Pharisees did. And, uh, you know, just think of people in your life and even yourself and myself, the times where you wanted to do something you knew that was not right, but you did it anyway, and you justified it. And that is, the heart is deceitfully wicked. Um, who can know it? You know, we're told that by Jeremiah. We see that Isaiah says the same thing. We see that David was a man after God's own heart, that uh, even though David sinned, in general, his heart countenance was one of pliable to God. And so this is not to wag fingers at anybody who's made a mistake. We're not talking about, Jesus isn't talking about if you ever do something wrong, it tells you what you are, and now we're going to label you that, and we're going to judge you for the rest of your life because of that. No, that's not what he's getting at. Everybody has a bad day. Um, you know, but the, the overall countenance of our heart is that our heart can trick us. And so we need to, when we're squeezed, what comes out of us is a good indication of where we need to focus our discipline on. We need to learn how to focus so that when we are squeezed, righteousness comes out. That is the, the ultimate goal, is that we don't behave just because we are good, obedient children and we're obeying the law. The Pharisees were excellent at that, good on the outside. But we want to get it to the point where our instincts are so tender towards God's will that things just happen that are good when we're squeezed, when somebody makes us angry, when somebody uh, offends us, when somebody does something that just really bothers us, that how we react first. You know, it's easy for somebody to lose their temper and then say later, oh, I shouldn't have done that. And that's a good thing to do. If you do make a mistake, we, we pray and get restored. But uh, I, I hope that it's like when somebody uh, attacks you in the future, that you just say, Lord, forgive them. They know not what they do. And that be a true heart response action. See, God's not wanting us just to act like good Christians. He wants us to continually surrender our heart because it can trick us. So it's an active thing to do. It's a discipline. This is why we're have this teaching here on how to be a disciple, it's because it's tough. And I often liken salvation to like being given a car and then driving it. Uh, it's easy to receive somebody giving you a brand new car, but then you have the rules to the road. So this is why we say salvation is easy. It's receiving a gift, but then living out our Christian life as a disciple is driving the car. Uh, we could drive into the ditch, the car is still ours, it's just that we've done some damage along the way. And uh, so let's learn how to drive this thing called faith right. And so that we should always be attentive to all the signs as the, you see on the road, help us to drive. See, we look through the scripture to help our hearts to want to do what God says is right. What I also find interesting is the way that Jesus tells the disciples how to handle the Pharisees is very similar to the way the Old Testament was told to speak of false prophets. When somebody claims that they're speaking on the authority of God and they prove that they are wrong, it says, pay them no mind, you don't need to fear them, don't listen to them, don't receive them. And this is exactly what Jesus is telling about the Pharisees. He's essentially calling them false prophets. Uh, it's quite a scandalous thing. That's why they were offended so badly. And the word is that for offended is scandalizo in the Greek, which means uh, scandalized. They couldn't believe it. It would be much like someone telling us that everything that we've done from the Reformation till now as Protestants uh, has been completely wrong and completely off base from what God wanted us to do. Uh, we would we'd be shocked. We'd be thinking, no way, we're the ones that are the majority of uh, theological thinkers. We're the ones who have tried hard. We've been here and established, and we've thought about this really hard. We talk about it all the time to try to refine and get better. And so for the, the Pharisees to be told they're that wrong, um, it, was, it was scandalous to them. And But they really were. Their hearts were so far from God. And this is why we need to make sure that, A, we don't ever become arrogant in a particular vein of theology. Um, but we do make stances, of course, but we do always want to make sure we have a tender heart when talking to our fellow believer about the tough topics. And uh, so 
This is why we want to make sure that the end goal is for each human to be reconciled with God. That's what Matthew keeps saying about Jesus. He's saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And then he tells us to go out and do good along the way while we're spreading the word. And, uh, and so as that happens, we want everybody to grow closer to the Lord, everybody's heart to be moldable by God's. And arguing with people over silly matters uh, doesn't, <laughs> doesn't really help. And, uh, and so with that, let's, uh, let's go out and continue to, A, search our hearts to make sure we don't have a tradition, to make sure that we don't have a justification of doing wrong uh, in our own heart, but that we surrender uh, everything to God, our hearts. Let him to write his, his words on our heart, and let us not be hard-hearted as these were. And that uh, those who teach badly, uh, you don't even need to engage with them. We can just, just let them go on their way and pray for them that they too will reconcile with God. So my tip for you in this is stop, reflect, pray often. If we stop and reflect, search our hearts, you know, even as David exclaims, who's man that you're mindful of him, he prays that God would search his heart and find any wicked way and pull it out, that we need to stop, reflect, and pray very often in this regard. And that will help us to see what sort of false idols we have set up in our own life. What is interesting is Jesus gives the typecast of the, the typical well-known uh, sins, and he lumps them all into kind of the one. I got to tell you this, is I've helped a lot of people to grow in their faith and helped a lot of people once they've been tripped up with some of these sins. A lot of times people just think they need to get more disciplined on that particular issue. Um, that is almost never the case. That's not the, re that's just where it's acting out. And uh, in the same way that if something's going on deep inside of somebody and then they might snap at a person, no, they don't need, they don't need to go take anger management. They need to go get their heart healed because there's a cause and effect. And so for the reason that people say, why did this person do this sin? Or why did this person sin against me like that? Uh, and why did I sin that way? You might even be asking. And I got to tell you, out of the overflow of your, the status of your heart, your mouth will speak and your mind will make justifications for doing what is wrong. And so focusing on the wrong um, is only just a symptom. It's only just a clue to help you to find out what's really wrong. And again, that's what people focus on. If somebody has fits of rage, yeah, you do need to work on that but not by tranquilizing yourself. We need to find out what is it that is so uh, unright inside your heart that uh, that is your go-to. And uh, so I just really would like to encourage you, whatever sin keeps tripping you up, it's not the sin that's tripping you up. That particular one, I mean, anyway. What's tripping you up is something much deeper that makes you want to go do that sin. And so if we kind of reverse engineer this and say like, Lord, I really haven't given you my whole heart. I really don't want to give up some of the things that I like. Well, you know what? If we're allowing some darkness to stay in our heart, we are going to have a dichotomy in our heart that is going to do us no good. And we're going to be no good to anybody else around us either. So my encouragement is to you is to let's fully devote our hearts to the Lord, have him to search our hearts, and that we need to be have a willing spirit to be able to follow and do what he says. And we can't just have Jesus into like 90% of our lives and then like, no, no, you can stay out of this closet. No, he wants to get into all of it. And we are going to have issues and we're going to have overflow of the heart. Uh, our mouth is going to speak and reveal to us through our actions and through our, um, and through what we say and do is really going to reveal what we need to work on inside ourselves. Now, I give you all this as a tool for yourself. This is not a tool meant to go and try to see how other people react and then try to figure out what their sin is. Uh, no, we just take the log out of our own eye. And then once we have done that, we'll be able to coach people along the way to take the spec out of theirs. And so as we go from here today, I just pray that uh, your heart is healed, that, uh, you, that you let God into every area of your life. Stop, reflect, and pray, and watch God do miraculous things inside your soul to bring about healing and peace, and even a new sweet joy. Well, thank you for coming to church with me. God bless you. Have a great day. Let's do something together. Life is better in community. So let me encourage you to reach out to us via the connect card that you'll see in the description at the bottom of this video. That's your opportunity to just say hi. Let us know you're watching. Let us know how we can be praying for you. Or maybe you have some questions about faith, about our church, um, or about life in general. We're here to help you and we're happy to do so. I'd also like to thank those who are faithfully giving. I can't express my thanks enough. We're able to continue ministry in our community and abroad um, so wonderfully because of your faithfulness of giving the Lord's tithes and your offerings. So to go above and beyond his tithes is just incredible. And so for those of you who uh, want to come and visit us, please know that our service is a gift to you. We never ask for anything uh, from our guests. As a Christian, 
It is my act of worship to give to the Lord. And each one of us Christians uh, believe that. So if you want to come check us out, there's no pressure. Just come on over. Uh, if you did want to give, we have simple ways. Give at regalchurch.com for your e-transfer, no password required. You can drop it in the offering plate on Sundays, or you can drop through the to the office um, through the week. Just pop in, say hello, and uh, let us know who you are, and uh, we'd be happy to chat with you. Uh, we can also set up automatic deposit. We'll just send you the simple form, and you fill it out and send it back, and it's good to go. So thanks for your time, and God bless you. Thank you.